perspective on it, yeah. Okay, we are gonna get started in just a moment. Um, thank you for coming to our webinar. If you're just joining us, we do record these sessions. Um, we wanna make sure you know that. And we would love to know where you're tuning in from. If you wanna type in the chat box and say uh, what business you're with and where you're coming from, say hello. Just makes us feel like we're not just talking to each other, although isn't that lovely anyway. And um, I'm Deborah Gallant from e for all in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. And I'm gonna be your facilitator and moderator today. And we're gonna get started in just a moment or two. Come on, I know that some of you are out there. Tell us where you're calling in from. Oh, we got Cheryl from downtown Pittsfield, Inc. Hi, Cheryl. Glad to have you here. <laughs> All right, everyone else is going to be shy. All right, I think I'm going to get started. Casey, are we recording? We're all good? All good. Okay. So um, my name is uh, Deborah Gallant. I am the e for all Berkshire County Executive Director. And in the e for all family, I've become the one who's been um, coordinating these weekly webinars about what's going on and how can we run our businesses the best way we have done a couple of webinars on the government relief programs but this is really pretty different we're trying to make sure we're thinking about what's going on in your business and how you can make it thrive despite or you know if you got a, a, a ppp loan how do you use it well so the topic that we're going to talk about today is staying connected and engaged with our customers. I'll talk a little bit more about the topic in a moment, but we start all of our e for all workshops by a, a little centering exercise, sort of let's all be present and commit to, to being here. Karen, we record all of these and we put them on our e for all.org website. All of them are there for you. Um, I'm going to hand this off to Kelly Music, who is our program manager from our Longmont, Colorado e for all site. Kelly and um, another colleague of ours, Donna from Cape Cod, have been really helpful in these weekly webinars doing this centering piece because I'm great at a lot of things, but this is not my skill set. So we have other great resources in e for all So I'm going to pass it off to Kelly for a moment, and then I'll be right back. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to have us all here together. Um, I guess what we'll do, we just, as, as Deborah was saying, we were, we're going to center here, and the only purpose of this is just to kind of come to a place where we're present, where we can feel and receive what's going on, just by it in a deeper way. So I'll invite everyone to either gently close your eyes just before actual the lid closing, or if you feel comfortable, close them all the way and just let the lids fall gently down. And take a big natural breath in. And on the exhale, just let that breath float out naturally and sense the warmth just coming down through your arms, kind of get a little heavier in the seat where you're sitting or in the place where you're standing. Another breath in. And as we release out, let your forehead and the place between your eyes relax. Your face relaxes a little more with each breath. The next few breaths, your own natural flow, your own natural rhythm. Just notice as the breath comes in, the cool air. And as your breath goes out, the warm air. Settle deeply into your seat, into your place. And now with one big deep breath in, relax and let the final breath out and open your eyes gently. Just come back to center. It's just amazing how two or three breaths just with focus can really bring us to present. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, Kelly. I hope you'll stay with us for the talk. We do have another panelist who's supposed to come. She told me she was um, 
might be, uh, oh, there she is. Sherry's here. So you have perfect timing. Just did our centering exercise. Let me um, talk just a little bit about e for all and this webinar series before we dive right in. Um, I think most everyone who's on this call or watching the recording knows that e for all stands for Entrepreneurship for All. We're a nonprofit organization that partners with communities nationwide to help under-resourced individuals successfully start and grow their business through intensive business training, mentorship, and an extended professional support network. We are in uh, eight communities here and one in, in Massachusetts and one in Colorado, and we're lucky actually that Kelly, who just was with us, is from Colorado, as is one of our speakers. So this is week seven of our series. And the, one, the reason I came up with this, I was telling our presenters in our practice before, I don't know about you guys, we're watching probably too much television at my house, but every single commercial starts with, we understand in these times, and, and it's like from car commercials, from the banks, from CBS News, from everybody. And it's starting to feel, I don't know, to me, inauthentic and like opportunistic. So if you like read, read the subject lines of the emails that, that are coming in about, we understand, yeah, it feels really crappy to me. So I thought I want to bring some marketing professionals together and talk about what it is to connect with your customers, people who, clients who know you already, and stay authentic and genuine and continue to get their business and whatever it is that you get from them and get their attention in this really crazy time. So I'm going to um, introduce my three panelists. And, and the format of today is going to be that um, each of them is going to have about five or six minutes to talk about kind of their point of view about what's going on with staying connected and engaging with their customers and what they're doing with their organization. I'm really excited that Julie Smith, who's the marketing director for E4All is one of our people because I think E4All is in the same boat as, as every other organization. We're all in, how many of us, 34 employees, we're all in our own space, but we're trying to still have a message that we are a cohesive organization with a point of view and that's not easy. Um, so they're going to each introduce themselves, they're going to talk, um, and then we have a few panelist topics that we have already developed and, and we'll get into talking about. But I also want to highly encourage you as uh, viewers and participants to engage with us and you can use your chat function or your Q&A function. Um, Casey can unmute you. Um, and you can ask your question live or you can just type in the topic or give us an atta girl, let us know that you're out there. Um, it, it's, uh, the hour will go quickly and I think this is going to be an interesting one because I want to hear how you each are tackling the task of, of communicating and for Sherry, now Sherry Ruskus is going to go first. Sherry's actually a consultant and a coach who works with other small businesses. So she's definitely going to uh, been advising people about how to stay in touch. So um, Sherry Ruskus, Business Victories from Colorado, why don't you go first for your five or six minutes? Okay, I will. Thanks so much for having me here this morning. Um, so I have been uh, an entrepreneur myself for, I'd like to say, since the day of the yellow pages, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I've been around a while. And um, of course, none of us have ever seen anything like this. And I think it really allows the entrepreneur in us to come to life in ways never before. So I thought in honor, since it's the seventh webinar, I'm going to do seven steps really quick on how to... Um, to step up your marketing game more creatively and inexpensively because we've got to be doing the guerrilla marketing <clears throat> type of tools in our businesses. So number one is to really think differently. And you know, we've all been going through different stages of this from disbelief to now, like we're talking about reopening and what in the world does that mean? And how do we do it? Uh, paying attention to the number one thing, because I believe that service to our customers can be marketing right now. So that's the number one is to think differently and how can your service be different? Um, I was just on the phone with a client who has a Pilates studio 
and you know gyms are one of the things that are supposed to be opening up here in Colorado and she's like what am I supposed to do my clients don't want to come back and so we're really walking through steps that she can take to do that she's created an online program she's really reaching out to her customers and um, figuring that out um, I have another client who is an esthetician and what she's done during the last uh, couple of months is because she shut down pretty early because she immediately said this is a problem before we were mandated here in Colorado and um, she has wanted for years to start an apothecary and um, to be able to sell product uh, online and so she's been working to make that happen so it's really thinking outside the box with that and in doing so is number two is to stop and look at the assets of your business um, from your products to your services and again how can you serve now moving forward i know the local nursery i'm a pretty avid gardener and they've been doing it's interesting they've been doing i've been able to call get my order and i come curbside pick it up and and take off and it's been kind of strange but i've been doing it yesterday i called to do that and they said oh we're not doing that anymore because we're open now and i'm like what like I just, I just hung up the phone. I was just like, okay, then I guess I'm not coming there anymore. So it's really being mindful of that and your assets. Um, number three is to look for businesses that you can partner with who's out there that you can really, that, that you have the same customer base and that you can join forces and do it together. It's really, really important. Um, and an example, my daughter is a private chef and she's created this online program that she's doing with food bloggers. She's created an affiliate program. So she's making money for herself with them. She just connected with a, a food blogger that, that has 100,000 subscribers. There's a lot, you know, again, just using that ingenuity to do that. Number four is to gather up, if you haven't already done it, your customer and prospect lists, and then do the next three steps, which five is pick up that telephone. We forget that that telephone can be used uh, for more than texting, more than checking our emails, but to actually calling customers and finding out where they're at. I am actually shocked, again, as a customer of how many people I do business with, um, including my hair person and my nail person, who have not reached out to me at all during this time, at all. I mean, even when I had an upcoming appointment, I had to reach out to them and say, I guess this is canceled, right? Um, so it's really looking at, at reaching out and calling people. Um, number six, email marketing. Create email campaigns that matter. And I think, you know, uh, like Deborah was saying about, you know, the things that are unauthentic, that you know, we've all gotten them, the things that, you know, our place is clean. Well, great. That's, that's great. But does that make me feel better? I don't know. <laughs> what is it that you need to be saying? And what, what's resonating in your inbox that works for you and does it? I have many clients who have picked up the pace and are starting to send stuff out to their, their customers once a week that are, that are important, that are meaningful to their customers. So where are you sitting with your email marketing? Do you have a content calendar that you're using? And really plan it out over the weeks ahead, getting information out that matters to people. And then finally, number seven is to get on the social media platforms that you enjoy and that you want to engage on. I see so many people saying, oh, I hate this. I hate that. I don't want to be doing it. Figure out a way to make it happen. I happen to be, uh, I love Instagram and LinkedIn, and that's where I spend most of my time. And I've been making some amazing connections over the last, you know, four weeks uh, to eight weeks that, that have been just very meaningful and, and make your posts matter to those that are on there. So, um, and anything that you've been putting off around online marketing, now is the time. There's no better time. No better time. You know, what's really funny, Sherry, about what you said is my hairdresser actually called me about two weeks in to just say hi. I, she said she broke into her own shop because, of course, it's closed to get her book, to get everyone's phone numbers because she doesn't stay in touch with anyone on social media or email marketing, but the phone right. still works. So even if you think you don't have a way to get in touch with your customers, you totally do. So that's really great. Um, we will circle back to you. And I love those seven points. That's really yeah. helpful. Lindsay, you have a really different job. Lindsay Schmidt is our um, director of marketing, vice president, right, of marketing and tourism for One Berkshire, which is our local, acts as both our chamber and our tourism bureau. And 
wow, the rug is pulled out from underneath the whole tourist economy in Berkshire County and all the businesses that pay you dues aren't in business. So tell me, how are you staying in touch with people? So usually this time of year, um, my main focus would be on how are we talking to visitors? We're trying to keep our high season is coming. How do we get them here? It's when I'm spending the lion's share of our dollars um, and we're printing a guide in our website traffic. We're seeing a huge uptick. Um, basically, we've now flip-flopped that. So our my main focus now is the local audience, um, and where it would have been secondary this time. Not secondary, but it's not where the lion's share of my time would have been spent. Um, when this all occurred, we sort of said, whoa, whoa, let's take a step back. Um, the visitors can, will continue to be important, but it's really, we have to focus on Berkshire County right now and ensuring that our role as the Economic Development Agency is making sure that the businesses get the support that they need and they can get to the information as quickly as possible. So we did, you know, on our, we have two different websites. So we have berkshires.org, which is outward facing, and then oneberkshire.com, which is more internal facing. So we quickly pivoted our one Berkshire site to actually be more of a COVID response. Um, so if you go there now, um, the homepage is, you know, is all about COVID. It's a resource page as well as you know restaurant lists who are doing takeout and aside from you know sort of updating that on a daily basis and making sure sometimes it's an hourly basis that's being updated our team is working diligently um we also didn't want it just to be all doom and gloom and dire and you have to do this right now so on there you'll also see something that's home um homebound fun and so that's just looking at fun ways to stay engaged. A lot of those links are about Berkshire County initiatives, but some of them are, you know, staff picks from my team saying, hey, this is what I'm watching, this is what I'm reading. Just again, to, if you can use the word levity, to bring a little levity to people and businesses in Berkshire County sitting at home, some fun ideas. Um, and the virtual Berkshires one actually really helped me then pivot in terms of talking to the visitor. So although most of my focus is now on locals and making sure that they're engaged, that they know about our town halls that we do on Fridays, um, I still do, and especially now as we're talking about reopening, sort of have to now pivot back to sort of the visitor and go, okay, you can't come right now, but how do I make sure that you know that we're still here and that you are aware of the amazing assets that Berkshire County has that make it a, a destination that people will come back to first and foremost over other destinations. So, you know, in talking with the visitor economy folks here, finding out what they're thinking, how do we utilize open space differently? How do we open restaurants back up differently in terms of using outdoor space? Um, so the virtual Berkshires came about because we wanted to make sure that they, they had a way to sort of engage with Jacob's Pillow, whose season has been postponed, but they could still have amazing dance um, videos happening. Hancock Shaker Village right now is doing baby animals. So, you know, you can actually hire them to come and do, if you're doing a Zoom and you want baby animals just to show up, they'll like come into your Zoom meeting for you. So how cool is that? Just again, <laughs> making sure the cool things that Berks the Berkshires are doing like resonates much further outside of just the Berkshires or even New England, but further afield. Um, so for me, it's, yes, yeah, it's, 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 sometimes I sort of find myself going, wait, what am I supposed to be doing? Because usually my focus is so laser on the um, opening up for the season. And I, I'm sort of having to reinvent all of the time and sort of, but again, it's always going back to, okay, who today am I talking to, right? So it's always sort of saying, and I think this is true any marketing, and lots of times you have to sort of center back in and go, okay, who is my audience at, right at this moment? And does this, if I'm passing something along to my team saying, hey, this is super cool for social media, but is, is that going on the visitor social media page or is that going on my one Berkshire social media? Or does this actually resonate with both of those audiences, but then require a different sort of message layered on top of it when we talk to those two different audiences? So I think for me more and more, and I'm always thinking about the multiple audiences I serve, whether it's members or local folks here or the visitor. But again, this has really sharpened my ability to create that message and hone in on the specific group that I want to talk to. And also just realizing the importance of not being set in your ways in terms of how you're always talking. Like it's 
you have to be ready to pivot at any given moment. Um, so as tough as that has been, it's also exciting because you know, Deborah, you and I were talking about silver lining at the end of this. Like I'm starting to see not only, you know, one Berkshire sort of expanding its scope within the community and people started really realizing that we're here to help promote all businesses and to bring all of small businesses, large business, medium businesses, you know, rise that ship, you know, rising tides. Um, and then on top of that, also seeing what amazing new things are going to come out of this that makes the Berkshires an even more fantastic destination for people to come, not just visit, but also think about living. So, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's easy again to get, get down in the doom and gloom. And um, so every day started trying to keep positive in terms of that. And then, you know, working with my team, which one of our guys in economic development probably never thought he'd be like posting events on the Berkshires.org calendar page. But you know what? I think in this day and age, it's really like that coming together of community um, has been really important. So that's well, sort of thank where I'm at. That, that's great. I want to say a few things about what you said before I hand it over to Julie. Um, number one is I think the Berkshires is very well positioned for a tourism resurgence when things start opening up because I don't think people are getting on planes for their vacations, but they may be willing to drive. So hopefully our proximity to Boston and New York will get us um, a tide of people when things open up again. I'm hoping that's true anyway. That um, is what I hope also. <laughs> Um, number two, I want to just actually congratulate, you didn't even mention this. I thought this was the cleverest thing that you've done, um, or someone at One Berkshire did, offering the virtual backgrounds for my Zoom calls that were beautiful Berkshire shots. I was like, that's on topic, on brand, and it's totally today, and why not? I should have one up now. I don't, sorry. But my computer's too old, so it won't allow me to do it. I can only do it if I'm on my phone, so. I thought that was great. And and the other piece of it was, and I don't think Sherry mentioned this on hers, but um, if your website has not embraced the new reality and the pivot, you missed the boat. And this is why I've been preaching literally for 20 years to use a content management system so that your website can evolve to address things. And I'll just give you one example. We, we've been trying to order from local restaurants to support them. I go to their website and they say, yes, we're taking orders. And I order off their menu. And then we call them and go, oh, that's not our, our COVID menu. That's our regular menu. It's like, if you're going to say you're taking orders, then you need to put the correct menu up there. And one Berkshire has has flipped what they're offering on their website to uh, offer recordings of your town halls and the resources page and where their grants e for all which I'm going to hand off to Julie in a minute has a whole COVID section with re entrepreneur resources and these webinars and if you don't do that it's like you're tone deaf it's like you know did you miss the boat you can't just sell the way you sold before March 14th you need to be um, representing how you're doing business now. And I think One Berkshire has done a great job. And I, I also think e for all has. So good job, Lindsay. I know it's been tough. Thank you. I right, keep on doing it. Keep on keeping on. All right. Julie Smith is the um, uh, director of marketing for e for all She didn't like it when I called her the, the mothership. I guess there's no mothership <coughs> right now because we, we don't have a headquarters that's operating. We're all working out of our houses. But Julie's out of our Lowell Lawrence office when there is an office open. And um, she's actually uh, directed a rebrand of e for all which all happened right before all of this. Um, and um, you've um, had to figure out how e for all which is still moving forward and doing our programs, but doing them virtually, right? So we're having a virtual pitch contest next week here in the Berkshires. We did our virtual uh, showcase a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there's stuff going on in all of our communities. How do you message that and, and stay in people's consciousness when there's so many other things that people are talking about? So Julie, tell us what, what, what's on your plate right now. Sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, for e for all with a mission to help entrepreneurs start and grow a business, this, this is a, a critical time for us really to, to rise to the occasion and make sure we're doing everything we can. We've already helped over 500 businesses get their start, but the reality is 
we all had the, the rug pulled out from us basically overnight. And I think what's challenging to what Deborah you said is we've always prided ourselves in being deeply steeped in the communities we serve. And we are very much an in-person organization traditionally who has worked side by side with entrepreneurs. We've had mentors that you, you know, entrepreneurs meet with on a regular, on a weekly basis. So it's really all about the in-person. And frankly, overnight, as you said, we, like everyone else, had to change. And what I think um, we very quickly had to tack to, and it, and it took the entire organization, was this idea of how do we create the same level of community online? And how do we make sure what used to be, from a marketing standpoint, my goal was to uh, help people know upcoming accelerators and pitch contests and help get people uh, into programs they need to be to be much more practical information as to how do I survive? How do I get through this? Um, and I'd say, Deborah, to your point, and you've done a good job with this, we've really tried to become, how do we take this fire hose of information that people are being surrounded with day in, day out, and, and put it into a place and a channel that's more digestible and helpful? So I think some of the things we've done are we are now doing weekly emails um, where we really try to call out to our entrepreneurs, here are upcoming deadlines for the PPP program. Here is a webinar that might be of value to you, whether it's your weekly webinars or we've even had our CEO start doing webinars with uh, business influencers to try and again help fulfill our mission to help educate and prepare people in terms of starting their business. Um, so absolutely, as it relates to reaching people, we've moved from an on, you know, in-person model to much more frequent emails. As Sherry mentioned, uh, social media has been critical for us, um, and we've really taken a long, hard work uh, look at it. And Deborah and Casey are doing the same thing. We all are really trying to make sure that we are communicating the right message to the right audience on the right social media platform. Uh, because frankly, LinkedIn is going to be different than what we're going to say on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but I'd say um, the website was probably the third thing. And as you said, Deborah, we pretty quickly realized we had to pivot our website to have dedicated content that um, now includes things that we didn't necessarily have as a top priority before this happened, which is includes an alumni shopping network. Uh, a shopping directory, because we realize what we need to do is be a much better advocate for our businesses. And if it's not a webinar on our website, it's all the resources at a national and local level. And then lastly, this idea of a of a alumni shopping directory in both English, frankly, and in Spanish, because we have a we have a big Spanish presence in many of our markets. So we had to very quickly make sure we have resources available in both languages. Um, and then I think, you know, and I know Deborah, you know, I've talked about this, it's challenging because it's it's not ideal to be virtual given our desire to be in touch with people. But I would say, and you can talk to this as much, the the outreach and Sherry's point about picking up the phone, what I've been really heartened by has been clearly to me, all of our executive directors are picking up the phone and our program managers and they are calling our entrepreneurs and they are trying to stay in touch and make sure everyone has what they need so that we don't completely rely on an online email to get to people. And I think I think that is what will help our entrepreneurs and, and frankly help e for all remain relevant and plugged in as we move forward. I'm gonna actually ask you a follow-on question that, that goes to something we talked about yesterday on our program call, which is you said mm -hmm. that during all of this, our open rate on our emails has been much, much higher than it was before because yes. you think that there people have time. I'm interested to see if Sherry and Lindsay yeah. are also seeing that trend, but did that uh, did that yeah. apply yesterday when you sent out a big email? I haven't looked yet, so that's the funny thing. So, so <laughs> I'm always afraid to, but yeah, so we, we really try hard to track kind of open rate, click through, see how people are doing. And as Deborah said, um, what we have absolutely found are the emails we've launched, which are time sensitive, which provide very concrete information about how to apply for a loan, things we didn't used to do. Um, we're getting 50% open rates, which are way three times, four times higher than we typically would get with a more general update information. 
Um, so absolutely, if you have the right message, the right subject line, and it's relevant for people during these challenging times, you'll, I think we are finding responsiveness. Um, and I'm going to guess if it's not relevant, there's so many emails I'm sure we all get pounded by them. And if they're not something you need right now to help survive this, you're ignoring them. But I'd love to hear what Sherry has to say too, and, and Lindsay. Lindsay, how are your open rates? Do you want to share uh, any sort of insights you're getting on that I stuff? I haven't looked recently, um, which is not good. We just had a lot of other things going on. <laughs> but, um, exactly. I didn't tell her I was going to ask. In, in regards to e-communication, we definitely took a moment and took a step back there. We used to do a lot more to the visitor. Now we're just doing one a month, um, just sort of touching base. And, you know, we did a video about Instagram. Um, photographs and thanking people for using our hashtag. And we actually asked them a question to share with us their favorite Berkshire moments. And I did something similar to this a couple of years ago and we got zero response. And we've already gotten, you know, a handful of people who've written back sort of saying, hey, these are my great memories of the Berkshires. So definitely seeing a higher level of engagement with the actual content that's in there. And then as to the one Berkshire, when we're talking to the local community, you know, we actually, I had a conversation with our membership director sort of saying, should we be doing this every week? How many, how many is too many? And I was feeling like we were getting, I'm being bombarded by daily emails from some folks. And I said, I think I don't, we don't want to be that, but we need to be in a space that feels relevant and timely. So we've sort of kept ours when we're using the tool like MailChimp, we've kept those on an every other week basis, but then we have our database itself, which just has all the members listed. And so we do another on the off week, we do an email out to that list. So again, sort of reaching just slightly different constituent groups and both of them might have overlaying messages, but they'll also be different um, just so that we're, we're able to get at people in multiple directions. Sherry, your thoughts? You need to unmute. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been up about 10% on open rates. What, like, as Lindsay was saying, it's the engagement that's been really up that, uh, you know, I've been sending out weekly for years and years and years and, um, mine's more of a mindset piece that I send out and I've been actually writing mine real time. I usually do it a week ahead of time just to have it ready to publish, but I've been doing it real time as I used to do way back in the day. And the engagement's gone up so much. I mean, this week, I, and I really touching messages from people. And um, so again, it's coming, I just open my heart and say what I'm feeling. And um, in my particular email, and the response has been fantastic. So I, I get that yours, I, which I've been getting and reading for years, are, are feel very timely, which is why I do these webinars and don't plan them out very far in advance. And both Julie and Lindsay have information to share that is really timely and relevant. What worries me, and, and I'm trying to speak on behalf of the kinds of people who, who we help at e for all you know, how does... Erin, who has a Lego brick building business, write an email that feels relevant when it feels so marginal to be in that kind of a business right now, because it's not mission critical, right? You can do without Lego bricks. How often can she send an email and how does she create subject lines that cut through the noise for her? Do you understand where I'm, I'm going? I think it's being fully present with what's happening with your customer. Again, it's having that customer engagement. It's sharing customer stories. Here's what's happening for our customers right now. So that, that you're, you're really the engagement, that word engagement has to be used so much right now so that, that what the pain, everybody's feeling pain right now and it's getting to that pain point and being able to share uh, what you're experiencing. I mean, I even saw something from United the other day that, and usually, you know, when I get the big corp emails, I'm like, oh, you know, is, can I just delete this now? But it was really kind of heartfelt from their CEO and I could feel it. Um, so again, it's finding your groove and your rhythm of what's really important. Uh, my Pilates gal, like I was just saying, she's sending something out about different body parts that are hurting. You know, she's kind of got a series set up. So it, it's paying attention to your content calendar, what's important right now.
And I think- And I would, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Right now, um, as a mom who's at home and knowing yeah. what the Lego folks <laughs> are do, um, any sort of creative suggestion, I have Lego sitting around, so any sort of creative suggestions, then, yep. hey, just do this project, or, okay, we're doing per drive-by birthday parades now, but is your kid's birthday in six months? You know, let us, you know, start, plan you know, when things open back up, start planning, you know, we'll ha happily do an open air Lego party. So it's thinking about what they can do right now to help me, but then also mm -hmm. I have time now to think about <laughs> planning out in the future. So again, it's the audience, right? So I'm a <laughs> working mom with kids. So how do you talk to me versus how do you talk to sort of a, a millennial who maybe in six months would be wanting to do something? Um, I think that would you know be useful in terms of info that I would get into my um, inbox. Julie? No, I totally agree. I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm very thankful my daughter is beyond the Lego stage at this point, because I think there's a lot of pain right now that parents with younger kids that we all sit on Zoom calls with them. And I think she actually has a unique opportunity to reach parents who are absolutely looking for things to do um, and entertain their children. So she, she just has to meet, I mean, to me, the whole goal is just meeting people where they are right now. And that's very different from where they were eight weeks ago, but there's still a role for a lot of the products and services that I think our, our entrepreneurs do. They just have to be repositioned. Um, and I think Lindsay makes a good point. It's, it's not only what can I, what can I um, help with now, but six months down the road, because I do think a lot of people, it's a, it's a really good point. People are starting to think like, I can't keep going like this. So the idea of someone coming out with a picture, picture August, where you might be able to do X, Y, Z, um, would be, m make people feel good, kind of, you know, make it positive, make it optimistic. And so, so I feel patient. like the, the conversation that the four of us are having is seems almost back to marketing 101 principles, right? The, the first class, understand mm -hmm. who your customer is and make sure your message and your content. How come the emails that we get, right? All those subject lines seem like, I don't know, Aruba for five days, it's like travel zoo didn't, it's like they, they don't know this is going on. It, and, right. Or it's the, we understand, you know, those car commercials. And it feels like so many uh, organizations are missing their messaging. They just are blowing it from day one. They're either trying to be overly sympathetic when it doesn't make sense, or they're acting like this didn't happen. And I have, it feels very bewildering to me as a marketer. Well, and like you said with the website too, it's not business as usual right now. It's very unusual. And it, it you know, we hear talk about the new normal, um, which makes some people cringe, like, could this be the new normal? But what the benefits that are coming out of this and, the, and uh, I forget who said it about, you know, pivoting to the silver lining. And, and I think if we can do that, and I know with most of the entrepreneurs that I work with, that's what we talk about all the time is what is the silver lining? Like, what is I have so, especially women entrepreneurs, and it's been interesting, and I'll just share this quickly, that have, you know, gotten the PPP monies in or have ended up on unemployment, whichever worked out for their particular business, they've almost said, I feel guilty taking this money because I'm not in dire straits right now. And I'm like, use this to build your business, lift yourself up from this and go to the next level than you would have even before this time. Cause it's, it's just a time for uplifting without a doubt. I mean, if I were a car company right now, I, and I've seen the same as you have, and it, it's so their go-to to strike that chord and, and the somber and the, it's just, it's like, that's their routine. I would love to see a car commercial that actually talks about the fact that I, for one, love to jump in my car now because it's the only place I feel safe and drive around and make it into a fun thing. It's like all the things you can do in your car now because frankly, that's where we all are. I'd love to see an ad that shows the drive-by birthday parties and the, you know, so all the cute. things you can do. But yeah. I think you're, I think you are, people don't know what to do and big brands don't like to stray too far from where they, they're comfortable. And I think like car brands and that they they always go for the heart 
you know, the heartstring and it's, I'm with you. It doesn't, it doesn't speak to me at all. Um, but we might be expecting too much. I, I think some brands have done a nice job. I do. And I, you're probably gonna ask me which ones now and I'm, I'm going to struggle to think what it is, but I think some have, but. I, I think um, I saw, um, it was for Facebook's one of their platforms mm, and it showed all these mm -hmm. clips of people having fun at home, right? The, the moms and the kids doing yep. TikToks and stuff. Yep. And honestly, my husband's reaction to that was like, that's not going on every day at every house. I guess that they're taking the best of it and they're trying to say, mm -hmm. look, you can make the best of it. You know, there are days you want to take the other people in your house and hit them with a frying pan. <laughs> it's hard staying in for, what are we on, 55 days now. This is really hard. Um, and sometimes making it too light feels fake too. I don't know. Well, I think there's a, something to be said. I, I do think the major brands, it's hard for them to pivot, right? Because, and they have a team of how many people and how long does yep. that disseminate yeah. down? Um, yep. um, yeah. So I do think actually in this current environment, sort of the entrepreneurs and these startups are sort of in a unique position to, because they can get mm -hmm. that authentic message out that mm -hmm. them, right? They, they can talk about how much you like wanted to smash the frozen pork, pork chops over your husband's head because he was doing <laughs> that. Um, I don't know if that's ever occurred to me, ever. <laughs> um, I think, again, so I'm not sure who's on the call, but if you are sort of a smaller brand, like this is your chance to like actually get out ahead mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. of these larger brands totally. because people, if you're really real with them, I think this is now the time that they're going to really find loyalty in different places. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree that I want to bring up something that that's been bothering me. And we've talked about this at E for all a few times, email marketing, social media, even phone calls, um, only really work for people who are pretty wired. Um, and, and I feel that E for all as somebody who's trying to reach under-resourced individuals, may be missing the boat. Like I had somebody who was speaking Spanish call me the mm -hmm. other day and she wanted help over the phone. I didn't understand what she was saying. And she read me her email address even after I asked her to send me an email. She just isn't wired. She's not getting, I can't contact her using all the media that I use to bring people on this webinar to in communicate with people. I feel like there's a segment of our population that it's just impossible to reach right now. Julie, you're seeing this, right? Oh yeah, and and to be honest with you, Deborah, our because we have to for safety reasons, our programming requires you to be wired, because it has to because we can't meet in person. So you're right, it's it's disappointing I think to everybody uh, that we can't meet people where they are right now offline, um, and I don't have an easy answer for you because there's just no way we, as you know, we can do it in person. And what we used to do were flyers and you would have people come in and you would have partnerships and events you would go to and meet people. And we just can't do that right now. And I think we have to continue to challenge ourselves to figure out how we reach those people who may not be as, as you're saying, like social media savvy or uh, web enabled, but it's, it's a challenge. Well, and here in the Berkshires, um, Lindsay can t certainly testify to this. There are people who sit outside libraries in their cars yeah. and use the Wi-Fi network yeah. because they're not getting Wi-Fi at home because we yeah. don't have Wi-Fi on all 120 miles of our, our county. Yeah. I think well, yeah. you have to, I've been doing this more and, you know, even on the website and, play, and when I'm sending out, when I'm sort of talking again, I'm sending it out an email, but make sure you do have your phone number you know, make sure mm -hmm. that we used to say, oh, just email us or just do this. But when you're talking, so if Jonathan's doing an interview, you know, with one of the local newspapers, it's, you know, visit our website, but also we're here and call us at, in this mm -hmm. phone number. Um, and mm -hmm. then making sure that even though we're all working remotely, that we're then checking our voicemails and actively getting back to those phone calls. Well, I, Sorry. We, it just, it goes back to the telephone, but most people have a telephone. And I, I, it's so amazing to me how adverse we've become to the telephone. Um, and I guess for me, my first business was a telephone answering service. So I <laughs> always have a love for that. Um, but it's be, being able to pick up the phone and call people and really, um, I, I mean, even a client this morning, we were talking about, she says, yeah, 
I have some clients because her client base is 65 plus and she said most many of my clients don't have cameras on their on their computers so it's a problem and I said great well why don't you FaceTime them on their phone and she's like oh I didn't even think of that you know so it's just again sometimes it's the littlest of solutions that can connect you with your customers too and Deborah, to your point, the only thing I, I would say to that is, is we are trying really hard. I, I think the role of local publications now has become even that much more important for people who are looking for more, again, specific community information. So we're trying really hard through PR and outreach to make sure we get the word out so that if you're not getting emails or on our email list or on social, but you pick up the Lowell Sun, there's a front page story about how entrepreneurs are trying to be successful and, and Liana's information is in there. And we're, we're trying to reach people that way because you're right, they, that might be a, a, an avenue for us that we always wanted to do, but now it's even that much more pressing to, to get the word out that way. All right, I have another topic I wanna bring up and one that I didn't actually prepare the uh, panelists for, so I'll be interested to hear what you have to say, but I wanna remind everyone who's on with us, we're delighted that you're here. And if you have questions that you'd like to have our expert marketers talk about, please enter them in the chat box or raise the uh, Q and A. There's a little hand raising thing at the bottom. So, so my question, this is one that I've actually had a little bit of a debate with. Do you think it's reasonable and possible to reach new customers or are, should you be focusing on people who already know you? Can, using these channels, can you really effectively reach new people? Lindsay, what do you think? I'm all about new people. <laughs> I, you know, I think <laughs> for both of the, not just the visitors, but as well as the local community, um, I think, yeah, for, especially for the local community, I think, again, we've, People know us as a membership organization, and so a lot of what we do is for the members. And really, again, in this time, we sort of said, okay, let's throw the membership. You know, you don't have to be a member to be involved. You don't have to be a member to be getting our communications. We're here to support you as someone who lives and works in Berkshire County. Um, so I think that's a positive. I think at the end of the day, my hope is that people who maybe didn't even know what one Berkshire was before we went into this will be like, oh, we, I've heard about this one, but you know, they actually helped me out. I actually got a resource from them. I actually used their restaurant list during this time. So whether or not that means they become a member down the road, it just means that the organization, especially because we're an organization that somewhat is in its infancy, um, will have a better knowledge of this resource that exists in Berkshire County. And then for visitors, I think, we going back to the silver lining, I, our traditional visitors, much older and they come in the summertime. And really what my hope is that with this happening, we can reach out to a younger demographic. We've been trying to do that and we struggle because we have our sort of traditional visitor who comes and we have three night minimums. Um, right now there's a possibility that maybe this summer we get those 35 year olds with kids to discover the Berkshires and go hiking and you know, and so we can start to really plant a seed there um, and grow that audience longer term, um, which will really um, be a great driver for the economy in the long run. Mm -hmm. Jerry, what do you think? New customers? I, th I think there's always, it's always good to have a good blend. And I will share a quick story of a local photographer who decided to, um, you know, her business is pretty dead at this point. And um, she decided to create graduation, um, uh, sign yard signs for um, the, the seniors this year because you know they're really somebody who's missing out on a lot of fun and all that so she she created these yard signs and um, has had really great success with it um, local news channel picked it up and um, did an amazing piece on it for her and her business which will benefit her in the long run so remembering the PR side of things too um, when it comes to what you're doing Julie, has, is e for all still reaching new people? Well, sadly, I mean, I think the stat is in Massachusetts alone, one in four people are unemployed. I mean, it's people need to find a new way forward. And, and e for all and its ability, if you have a business idea that you weren't pursuing before, you may be in a situation now where that's your best option. So we absolutely believe, and, and frankly, the the applications have shown uh, there's still definite demand 
for for e for all and e para todos and um you know it may be a little bit more towards pivoting the business than that you know it's both it's, it's as sherry said it's kind of meeting people who may now need to shift it up but i think new entrepreneurs are definitely out there uh and the, the time is now for us to to try and help them I know that our um, colleague in Roxbury, Kofi, had an amazing, like 49 applications for it, his 15 yeah. places in his accelerator. It, so and Lowell, there's a need Lowell still. Lawrence, yeah, and South, New Fall River, New Bedford, all, all we, we saw continued strong demand for the accelerators. Um, and, and yeah, particularly in Roxbury, we, he had a really good outpouring. I mean, it's, it's challenging because you know people are in tough spots, but if we can help them get a new start it's it's great for them well and i think the fact that we've pivoted as an organization to offer these classes virtually means yeah. that yeah. you know to get that support to start up your business without having to violate the go out of your house Absolutely. stuff it, i think that's huge and that goes to i think the um the organizational strength and the programs. And honestly, what's funny for e for all is that this isn't hugely different than how I worked before. Yeah, I would go to co-working places and I would meet people, but this was my workplace to start with and we were all wired. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like we were starting from zero. So I think that helped a lot. Um, I wanna uh, wrap it up with one last question about how you think things will ease back into normal. And, you know, for instance, I, I have on my list to ask Lindsay about, you know, one Berkshire was all about the big events, right? Your annual meeting, your giant fundraisers, your awards banquets. What is your thinking about what that's gonna look like moving forward? Oh, that, I, I don't know if only I had a crystal ball. Um, we, <laughs> and we also did on weekly, almost weekly, monthly basis, we had chamber nights and entrepreneurial meetups and all that. And we're actually as a team sort of collectively talking about that, you know, sort of wanting to get those entrepreneurial meetups back up and running and how do we use Zoom and how do we use the classroom function. So we actually tried that out as a team yesterday. So I think that's forthcoming. Um, but yeah, Christine, our director of membership is also like, oh, we miss the chamber nights. We need ways to connect. So thinking about doing that virtually, but then when it comes to those big events, I, I'm not sure. I think we'll get there eventually. I'm just not sure if this is the year um, for those to happen, but I don't know, you know, come September, come December, I might, you know, the, it sort of comes down to what the state's reopening policies are. Um, and I think even more so when we are able to sort of come together and congregate, there's going to be, I think we'll see even more people than we would have in the past, just because I think people are really craving pent, that. Pent up demand. Yeah. yeah, craving that connection, but I just want to make sure that we're doing it as safely as possible. So I don't really know the best solution there. Um, I think for a time, it will be much more about small convening. Um, in, you know, groups of, you know, 10 to 20 versus 200 or 300. Yeah, I, I do also want to mention that next week's webinar is literally on the subject of what will gathering look like. And we're going to actually, we have a really terrific panel, including Eferal's director of programs, Shelly Carduz. Um, we have somebody who runs a co-working space and is actually working on the election. Mm -hmm. And we have a woman who owns a hospitality business that has a restaurant and event space and a hotel. So we're gonna get some really good perspectives about what that means. And, and I don't mean to push any of you who are the marketers on the on that, but actually Sherry, your point about your garden center, like they feel it feels wrong that they don't understand that curbside is still what you want. Are people too quickly going back to the old way and are they missing the boat there? Well, and I think in that case, like they're getting super busy right now because gardening is up. Like it's one of the businesses that's really up. And so they're too busy for it. I mean, that's another part of it. And so that's like, great. Well, I'm one of your devoted customers. So what does that mean for me? But, you know, to your question too, I mean, I'm a, um, I'm a mom of a daughter who was supposed to get married in the fall. And now we're at this, so it's this whole plan B, C, D, E, F, G, like which one are we going to pick for the wedding? Because mm -hmm. like the wedding as it was going to be is not happening. Like that we know for sure. We're talking pop-up wedding, maybe July, maybe August, you know, depending, we don't know. And, you know, my, my daughter last night was in tears, like 
how could this be happening? But it's like, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, that, you know, I don't even know if I can get on an airplane. I don't know what's going to happen. So it's really, we have to plan for what, you know, and not being stuck in something so deeply that we can't, you know, the, the word of the year is pivot without a doubt. <laughs> well, and what was interesting for me with the Eat for All is that they made the decision to go with virtual accelerators that are, they're going to be starting in early June or, or later in May. And here's the thing, potentially by the end, they could be in person. We don't know that, but the, the sure thing, the knowing how it's going to be run was actually, I think made much more sense to say, this is going to be a virtual mm -hmm. program. And I think everyone felt more comfortable that maybe at the end, we'll all be delighted and we can get together and celebrate mm -hmm. a gala and showcase together. But there's something about just saying, okay, this is what it's going to be that I think makes it easier to move forward. Julie, you have any other thoughts on, on what the new normal is going to be? No, but I think I think to your your comment earlier about silver lining, I think the one interesting thing that has clearly become uh, more obvious is the one upside of these virtual events, which we have been holding successfully, and as you said, we're going to have our accelerators, is that it does kind of open the door for more participation and more volunteer and mentoring opportunities that people who could not have been in person. So part of the strength of our program was the in-person and you meet with your mentors uh, every week, all three. You know, it's trade-off, but we, we, we have to make it right now. But the idea that you could actually recruit potentially mentors and volunteers who may not be able to make in-person um, could end up being beneficial. Uh, so I think in some ways, you know, trying to frame it positively, it does, it does open some doors in some ways when you go virtual. Uh, never, I absolutely am not saying it's the way we're gonna keep going or it's, it's the way it should be, but it just, you know, you try to work with what you have. And if we have to stay virtual, um, that is one, I'd say to me, benefit of it. Um, and that's somewhat selfishly from a marketing standpoint because it opens a lot more uh, recruiting opportunities to me to be able to say that there could be a mentor who's uh, located outside our area who might be really willing to get on the phone. And, you know, we, we might be able to help ourselves that way and, and help our entrepreneurs. Well, and I think that one of the things that came across in our program call that we had yesterday about the virtual accelerator is we're, we're not going to compare it to a regular accelerator. We're just going to no, say, yeah. this is a great program. And you have to embrace whatever the new is without yeah. making it yep. seem like it's a second best. This is what the new is. And we're going to just make yep. the best of it. So Agreed. Um, Agreed. we are almost at the end of our time. Do any of the panelists want to have a, a parting comment or thought or inspiration you want to give to the people who are watching this? I would just say is just to be open minded to accept what is in this time, keep your head space good um, and be open to the possibilities. Thanks, Sherry. Lindsay? I think it's, yeah, it's about that sort of authentic messaging. Think of it less as marketing and really just, you know, be honest with where you are and tell your story um, and, you know, spend less time worrying about, oh, it has to be on this platform, this platform, this platform. Um, again, think about who you're talking to and then just really be open and honest um, about where you are right now and you know where you're going and sort of remember that you have a unique value proposition and that's what people really want to hear. Thanks. Julie? I guess what I'd say is, uh, I think, and, and probably a lot of people have already done this, I think it's important to kind of grieve and acknowledge the, the loss that, that I think a lot of small businesses are feeling, but then you got to dust yourself off and you got to figure out what you can do moving forward. There's just, <laughs> is, as our, our chairman of our board says, uh, chairperson, uh, live to fight another day. You, you got to, as hard as it is, there's most likely a path forward for your business, but you have to let go of the past and you have to um, really open your mind, as, as Sherry said to new opportunities. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you for the attendees who hung in with us. I always feel recharged after one of these webinars because we're all doing such cool and interesting and motivational things around the country and, and connecting with other people, I think helps remind us of 
there's positive things happening out there. Next week, the webinar is about what will gathering look like after COVID. I hope I see you all then. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, especially Casey for behind the scenes for running yes. the whole webinar for us. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.